Good evening. My name is Sarah Ackerman, and I hold the distinct pleasure of acting as a director in support of the incredible digestive health team at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture. We host a lecture series yearly on a host of topics of digestive concerns. Digestive health is comprised of a team of pathologists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, oncologists, endocrinologists and radiologists who are looking to optimize care of the patient through innovations in research, education, and a multidisciplinary approach to the quality treatment of digestive and liver diseases. By emphasizing innovative and quality patient care, research, and education, we provide excellence in our areas of distinction, including bariatric surgery, therapeutic endoscopy, nutrition, esophageal, inflammatory bowel disease, colorectal, liver, pancreas, and biliary diseases. Education and research is truly embedded in everything we do. Our team from multiple specialties are working together to improve your health and well-being, teach the world about what we do best, translate cutting-edge research from lab to bedside, pursue quality initiatives to provide the very best care, and discover innovations to transform your experience. Since 1982, we have had national breakthroughs that have truly impacted the treatment of digestive diseases and support digestive health at the regional, national, and international levels. And while we feel that digestive health at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health is very special, we have been honored to be awarded numerous accolades over the years, a reflection of the hard work of our providers and their dedication to their patients. Our presenters this evening are Dr. Otto Lin and Dr. Val Simeonu. Dr. Otto Lin is the Deputy Section Head for Gastroenterology at Virginia Mason Medical Center. He received his Bachelor's of Science in both Biological Sciences and Electrical Engineering from Stanford before obtaining his medical degree from Harvard. He returned to Stanford for his residency and fellowship in gastroenterology before arriving at Virginia Mason in 2001. Dr. Lin has served as Medical Director of Quality Improvement and most recently acted as Co-Director of the Colorectal Center of Excellence. Dr. Val Semiano joined Virginia Mason in, two, in 2018 after completing his fellowship in colon and rectal surgery at the University of Minnesota. He received his Bachelor's in Biochemistry and Spanish from Indiana University where he also completed his medical degree. He went on to complete his surgical residency and an MPH at the University of Washington. Dr. Simeonu serves as co-director of the Colorectal Center of Excellence and associate medical director for colorectal surgery for the CARES Outcome Assessment Program. We are so honored to have both Dr. Lin and Dr. Simeonu speaking this evening and look forward to engaging in discussion with them during our Q&A section following their presentations. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, lecture on uh, how to prevent uh, colon cancer. My name is uh, Otto Lin. Uh, I'm one of the uh, gastrointestinal specialists uh, here at uh, Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle. I'm also a clinical associate professor of medicine at the uh, University of Washington School of Medicine. So first, uh, Let's uh, start off with some uh, numbers. We all know that uh, colon cancer is one of the most important cancers in the country. Uh, back in 2003, um, as you can see here, there were approximately 156,000 uh, new cases of uh, colorectal cancer diagnosed uh, every year. This made colon cancer the third most important cancer for both uh, men and women. Uh, there were also uh, about uh, 57,000 uh, deaths that were directly attributed, uh, attributed, uh, attributed to uh, colon cancer. Uh, if we fast forward to 2020, uh, you can see that the raw numbers uh, have remained uh, approximately the same. Uh, however, in the interim, uh, the U.S. population has um, increased uh, substantially from 290 million in 2003 to 331 million in 2020. So what this means is that there has essentially been a significant uh, decrease 
in both uh, the incidence rate as well as the mortality rate uh, for colon cancer during this uh, time period. And this has been mainly attributed to um, advances in colon cancer screening. There have also been some advances in colon cancer therapy, but most um, of the benefits are thought to have come from screening. And because of this, um, I'll be spending a lot of time talking about uh, colon cancer screening uh, in the rest of the talk. Because of the reduction in uh, the incidence rate, um, the cumulative uh, lifetime risk for developing colorectal cancer has decreased from about uh, 6% uh, 20 years ago to its current value of 4.5%. Nevertheless, uh, colon cancer re uh, remains uh, one of the most uh, important cancers in the country. Uh, it is associated with several known risk factors uh, shown here in this slide. And you see here that some of the risk factors are non-modifiable. Uh, for example, genetic makeup, which is represented in uh, family history and uh, specific uh, genetic syndromes. These are non-modifiable, uh, but nevertheless uh, very important. Uh, some of the uh, risk factors are modifiable. Uh, and this includes uh, diet, obesity, and uh, smoking. So in order to uh, reduce the risk of uh, dying from colon cancer, it's important to eat a healthy diet. Uh, what this means is uh, a diet that is high in fiber and low in red meats and fats. Uh, it's obviously important to avoid smoking uh, and uh, also to maintain a healthy uh, body weight. Uh, we all know about uh, BMI uh, or body mass index. Uh, this is essentially the weight of the patient uh, expressed in kilograms divided by the square of the height of the patient expressed in meters. Uh, an ideal BMI is uh, around, 50, uh, around uh, 25. Uh, anything over uh, a value of 30 is considered to be a marker for obesity and is associated with all kinds of medical conditions, uh, including uh, colorectal cancer. Now, one point I really want to make here uh, is that the most important thing that a patient can do to reduce his or her risk of getting uh, colon cancer and of dying from colon cancer is to undergo colon cancer screening. In fact, the impact of screening is larger than the combined impacts of diet smoking, and uh, body weight. Now, one of the reasons why screening is so important is that in many cases, uh, colon cancer does not uh, have any uh, symptoms. Uh, so in other words, it's a completely asymptomatic condition. Uh, however, in a minority of patients, uh, they can have uh, some symptoms, and these symptoms are divided into so-called alarm symptoms. These are symptoms that have uh, a higher likelihood of being associated with uh, colon cancer. Uh, and these include rectal bleeding and uh, unexplained anemia. There are also uh, so-called nonspecific symptoms. And these are symptoms that can be caused by a large variety of uh, different medical conditions, including but not limited to uh, colon cancer. Uh, and these uh, uh, symptoms include uh, such, uh, such uh, symptoms as uh, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, or weight loss. But again, I want to emphasize that many patients do not have any symptoms whatsoever, thus the importance of uh, colon cancer screening. Now, colon cancer is also highly associated with age. Um, in fact, uh, over 90% of cases of uh, colon cancer uh, occur in people over the age of 50. And because of this, uh, traditionally, we have always uh, recommended uh, that colon cancer screening should start at the age of 50. Now, this recommendation has been changed in the last uh, couple of years, and I'll talk uh, more about that uh, later on in the uh, presentation. This table summarizes um, some of the uh, currently accepted uh, screening methods for colon cancer. Um, unlike with other cancers, uh, there is a large menu 
of accepted uh, screening methods. Um, and, and you can see here that this table is quite complicated. But we really uh, need to focus only on uh, three of the most commonly used uh, methods, uh, which are outlined here in red. So FIT testing, uh, otherwise known as fecal immunochemical testing, uh, is a method to detect uh, microscopic amounts of uh, blood in the stool. Uh, if this method is used, then the testing should be done once a year. Screening colonoscopy, of course, is very important and uh, popular. Uh, if this is uh, selected, then the screening needs to be done every 10 years. And finally, fecal DNA testing, known by, uh, by its brand name of Cologuard, is be becoming more and more uh, popular. And uh, this uh, uh, should be done every three years. Now, you'll notice that almost all of these uh, methods on the left side are so-called two-step methods. Uh, in fact, the only method that's not a two-step method is screening colonoscopy itself. Um, and uh, you can see here in this diagram that with two-step methods, essentially any positive result will need to be followed, uh, followed up with a screening colonoscopy. And the reason is because colonoscopy is the only method that can remove precancerous uh, polyps and thereby prevent uh, colon cancer. It's also the only method that can biopsy suspicious uh, colon lesions and thereby confirm the diagnosis of colon cancer. This is a, a picture of a colonoscope. Um, it's essentially a video camera that's installed in a long flexible tube and the tube can be inserted into the colon and uh, we're able to examine the entire uh, colon, which is also known as the large intestines. And this diagram shows the anatomy of the colon. Uh, you can see here that the colon starts in this area uh, called the cecum, which is the junction between the small intestines and the large intestines. It then goes up the right side of the patient um, and this structure is known as the uh, ascending colon. Uh, then it comes across horizontally from right to left. Uh, and again, this structure is called the transverse colon. It then comes down the left side of the patient in the descending colon. It goes through this area, which is often very twisty uh, and is known as the sigmoid colon. And finally, it ends uh, in the uh, rectum, which leads to the uh, anal opening. And using the colonoscope, we can visualize uh, a large number of important lesions in the colon. For example, uh, colon cancer, which is shown here on the left, and uh, uh, precancerous polyps, uh, which is shown here on the right. Now, there are two reasons why colon cancer screening can potentially uh, reduce uh, the risk of uh, colon cancer. The first reason is because uh, colon cancer screening can often uh, detect asymptomatic early stage colon cancers. And you can see here that uh, just like many other types of cancers, colon cancer is divided into four uh, stages. Uh, obviously, um, the earlier the stage of diagnosis, the better the prognosis uh, is for the patient. So stage one cancers um, are relatively small, they're, they're localized, and they're uh, pretty easy to treat, and the survival is quite good. Uh, on the other hand, stage four cancers are much more difficult to deal with. So, so colon cancer can bring about a so-called stage shift uh, in that uh, the cancers that are diagnosed tend to be earlier in stage. Now, the second reason why colon cancer screening is effective at preventing colon cancer is shown in this uh, diagram. This is the so-called adenoma to cancer pathway. Um, and uh, it basically shows that the, the majority of colon cancers uh, are derived from precancerous lesions, which are called polyps. And you can see here that uh, it can take quite a few years for polyps to turn into a full-blown cancer. Now, if this process is uh, interrupted uh, by uh, polyp removal during colonoscopy, then the cancer can be prevented. 
And indeed, many studies have shown that uh, polypectomy is associated with a subsequent reduction in colon cancer mortality and incidence. This is probably the most famous uh, study uh, that's been published. Uh, it's called the National Polyp Study. And uh, this study showed that polypectomy can reduce colon cancer mortality by as much as 53%. Now, I already mentioned that family history is, is a strong risk factor for colon cancer. Um, and uh, this table summarizes uh, some of the data on uh, family history. Uh, for example, uh, you can see here that um, for uh, first degree, uh, for patients with a first degree relative with uh, colorectal cancer, this means either uh, a parent with colon cancer or a sibling with colon cancer. Then the risk uh, of the patient uh, getting uh, colon cancer is increased by more than twofold. Because of this, uh, several of our medical societies uh, in this country have put forward specific guidelines for so called high-risk uh, patients who have a family history of colon cancer. Uh, and uh, these are shown in this uh, large and uh, kind of uh, busy table. Uh, I just want you to focus on these three boxes. Um, basically, what it says is that for high-risk patients, the colon cancer screening should start earlier at age 40, and the screening intervals for the colonoscopies should be shorter at five years instead of 10 years. Now, as I mentioned, uh, other than uh, colonoscopy, uh, FIT testing is another uh, uh, colon cancer screening method that's commonly used, and it's uh, shown here. Uh, FIT testing is more accurate than uh, traditional uh, GWAC testing, which is why it's more uh, popular. In addition, there are no dietary or medication uh, restrictions, which makes it much more convenient for patients. And as I mentioned uh, before, uh, if FIT testing is used, it needs to be done once a year. And studies have shown that FIT, te uh, fit testing is associated with a reduction in subsequent uh, colon cancer mortality. Now, Cologuard, which is the fecal DNA test, uh, is essentially a more accurate form of FIT testing. So this is a test that not only uh, detects microscopic amounts of blood. It also detects uh, specific genetic mutations. Um, and studies have also shown that uh, Cologuard can reduce uh, the uh, uh, subsequent uh, colon cancer mortality. Now, because of all the emphasis on colon cancer screening in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, there has definitely been a, a significant reduction in colon cancer mortality in people over the age of 50, uh, as you can see here on the right side. Um, unfortunately, this has not been true in younger patients. So if you look at the left side, so for younger patients, these are patients younger than 50, so these are patients who are typically not screened for colon cancer. You can see here that there has actually been a slight increase in the uh, mortality rate uh, from colon cancer uh, during the past uh, few years. And because of this, um, the screening guidelines have been changed uh, in the last uh, one to two years. Uh, we now recommend that colon cancer screening uh, should start at the age of 45 instead of 50 in average risk uh, patients who do not have a family history of colon cancer. And this process started uh, back in 2018 with the American Cancer Society, who first put forward uh, new guidelines that recommended uh, colon cancer screening at uh, age uh, 45. At that time, uh, it was a very controversial uh, decision. Um, the, uh, many of the other societies did not agree with that. Uh, it would cost a lot to uh, screen uh, large numbers of younger uh, patients. Uh, but uh, the data kept accumulating, and in late 2020, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, put forward uh, draft guidelines uh, that essentially also recommend uh, colon cancer screening starting at age 45. And this is important because the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force 
is a quasi-governmental uh, body that is probably the most respected uh, organization uh, when it comes to uh, screening guidelines. In addition, by law, uh, according to the Affordable Care Act, um, all insurance plans will have to cover uh, screening recommendations that are endorsed by the U.S. Uh, Preventive Services uh, Task Force. So right now we're in a transition phase uh, because these guidelines are still in, in, in the draft uh, stage. Uh, many insurance plans are already covering uh, colon cancer screening in people uh, at age uh, 45. Uh, and we expect that uh, in the next uh, few years, all insurance plans will start covering uh, colon cancer screening at age uh, 45. And many of the uh, medical societies are also starting to come around. For example, the American College of Gastroenterology uh, just published uh, new guidelines uh, last month. Uh, and these guidelines uh, do suggest uh, screening at age 45. So uh, let me just end with a few uh, take-home messages. Colon cancer is still the third most important cancer in the country. Uh, it's more common in men, uh, older folks, and those with a family history of colon cancer. Uh, it is often completely uh, asymptomatic, and yet is one of the most uh, preventable uh, cancers that we deal with. Uh, there's been no question that screening has reduced uh, the mortality rate from colon cancer uh, in Americans uh, over the age of 50. However, uh, for unclear reasons, uh, colon cancer in Americans younger uh, than 50 has increased uh, over the past decade. Because of this, uh, colon cancer screening is now recommended to start uh, at age uh, 45 instead of 50, um, and colonoscopy fit testing, and Cologuard are currently the three most commonly used uh, screening methods. So I think I'll stop there and uh, thank you for coming uh, to this lecture on colon cancer prevention. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, during the uh, Q&A uh, session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this public lecture uh, from the Digestive Disease Institute. I'm Val Simiano. I'm a colon and rectal surgeon. Uh, following that presentation by Dr. Lin, we're going to be talking about what, uh, what happens once you're actually diagnosed with colon cancer and how we treat it. Um, and I want to emphasize, like he said, why is this so important? And that's because um, these cancers, which, uh, which as you heard, start as polyps, uh, they then, as you see on your screen left, slowly grow roots into the colon wall to go from an early stage uh, or stage zero or one cancer to a more advanced cancer. Uh, but often we are able to cure colon cancer or rectal cancer when we detect it early. The catch here is that only in about 37% of our patients do we catch the cancers at this stage. Once you've been diagnosed with colon and rectal cancer, the next step your doctors are going to take is to try to stage your cancer. This staging of your cancer um, will often involve imaging and blood tests. These can be x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, or ultrasound. And your doctors are looking for where in your body this cancer could be or may have gone. Uh, learning what stage your cancer is is important to doctors because they can decide which treatment is appropriate for you and how you're going to do with that treatment. What are the treatment options uh, that are out there for colorectal cancer? You've probably heard of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and you've heard of surgery. So let's talk about these in brief. Chemotherapy you can think of as an anti-cancer drug. Uh, these can be given before uh, surgery for colorectal cancer or after, sometimes called neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy. Often uh, you need a special IV to receive chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy for colon and rectal cancer comes in a number of different forms, but it's typically given once uh, and then you repeat that cycle about every two to three weeks. Uh, the total treatment can go between three to six months and we're getting newer and newer evidence that, uh, that shorter cycles of chemotherapy are safe so you don't have to undergo treatment for as long. Uh, 
I also hear this sometimes, uh, and I want to squash this myth that older people cannot tolerate chemotherapy. That's absolutely not true. Uh, there are chemotherapy options for young people, for old people, uh, a number of treatments. Chemotherapy does kill cancer cells. It can also uh, affect some of the other rapidly producing cells in your body, like your hair, the lining in your mouth, or your GI tract. So it's very common that patients have some hair loss, some nausea, vomiting, and some diarrhea, uh, and some of the other changes you uh, see here. I'd say in the overall spectrum of chemotherapies, the, the ones we use for colon and rectal cancer are pretty well tolerated. Uh, my patients also ask uh, if there's a role for radiation in colon and rectal cancer. Uh, radiation is used uh, more often for rectal cancer than, from co than for colon cancer. And it serves two purposes. If that cancer is big or close to some important organs, we can use the radiation to shrink the cancer away. That radiation also has been shown in studies to keep the cancer from coming back. So in your individual case, your doctors may choose to recommend radiation. Again, it can happen either before or after treatment, uh, depending on your case. Uh, this is exciting to us because we've learned uh, for rectal cancer in particular, that combining chemotherapy and radiation therapy has made as many as one in three rectal cancers go away completely. Again, this is not all comers, and this may not uh, be what the doctors recommend, but we are optimistic about, uh, about the progress we've made in this field. Finally, this is my area, colon and rectal surgery. And I think there's a, a belief out there that surgery will make you very sick and that it's hard to tolerate. Well, like you heard from Dr. Lin, early cancers can be removed when they're still in their polyp phase. That means that even without surgery, uh, cutting open your abdomen, um, uh, your GI doctor, your colorectal surgeon, your providers can remove uh, the cancer entirely as part of a polyp. Or they can do what's called a local excision. You can think of it as a slightly bigger uh, polyp excision to include some of the wall of the colon to remove the cancer in its entirety. When the cancer is a little more advanced, uh, we typically recommend surgery to remove the cancer the, uh, with good margins on the colon around it and any of the lymph nodes it may have spread to. And in the current era, over 70% of this surgery is done either laparoscopically or robotically, like you see in the picture here. At Virginia Mason, uh, over 90% uh, of the surgery was done this way. Uh, in 2019 and 2020. So, um, so the era where you had to have a big incision uh, to get your cancer out uh, is in the past. The other thing that patients often ask is whether they're going to end up with a bag or an ostomy after this kind of surgery. And that also in the current era is very rare. Um, for colon, uh, it's probably in the 1 to 2 percent range that you're going to definitively need a, a stoma. Sometimes for rectal cancer, if the rectal cancer is very close to your anal canal, we have to do that. But again, that is very, very unlikely in most cancers. I think the most important part uh, of today's lecture and what you've heard from Dr. Lin and from, uh, from me is that you're, you discuss all of your treatment options with your doctors. On our side, we're going to discuss your case amongst ourselves with the oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the surgeons, the gastroenterologist to figure out what plan is personalized and best for you. Uh, but it's important to ask the questions if there's anything you're not sure about. Look forward to chatting with you a little bit more this evening. Thank you.